But it's good to be with you this morning. I've enjoyed my week this week. You have received me so warmly and I appreciate it so much. This is actually the first morning that I've had enough voice to even attempt to sing. And this may turn out to be more of an attempt than actually singing. But uh, there is a song that uh, is an old hymn of the church that uh, is, a, is a blessing to my own spirit. It speaks of the great faithfulness of our God who is unchanging. The scripture writer said, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the name of the wonderful hymn of the church is Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness. Irin on the rope Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not as thou hast been. Thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Thy faith. 
ago is an account of the days after the or surrounding the ascension of Jesus and then the morning of the day of Pentecost. In its basic form, Pentecost is an old Hebrew word that just simply means 50 days. In the Old Testament, it was a uh, feast that happened 50 days following the finish of the Passover feast. It was held at the end of the wheat harvest and it celebrated the giving of the law. When we move into the New Testament, all of a sudden we find that Pentecost takes on a new meaning. <laughs> Fifty days after Jesus celebrated Pente uh, the Passover with his disciples. Now we find 120 of Jesus' disciples, Jesus' followers, gathered together in an upper room, fulfilling and obeying the commandment that Jesus had given them. And the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Pentecost, for the New Testament believer, signifies the fullness of God's Holy Spirit living in His church. Pentecost fulfilled the promise of the prophet Joel. As he spoke the words of the Father, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It fulfilled the promise of Jesus when he said, I will send the Spirit after me. And it was also the answer to Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 that we might be sanctified or filled with his Holy Spirit. And I would say to you this morning that every believer needs to have a personal Pentecost in your life. You see, nothing less than Pentecost, a personal Pentecost, will enable you and empower you and give you the strength to live the way Jesus would ask you to live. It is not enough to know Christ in salvation. We must also open ourselves to the fullness of Christ by His Holy Spirit 
in this infilling of the Holy Spirit. In Wesleyan circles, we call that sanctifying grace. And we explain it in these terms, that after a person is saved, there is a war that goes on within us. There is the old nature of sin that still lives within our spirits. But now we have been introduced to a new nature by the presence of the Holy Spirit who comes in salvation. I hear somebody say, well, if the Holy Spirit comes in salvation, then why do I need to seek His fullness in sanctification? You're asking good questions. I'm glad you asked. Because the fact is, you can go on and continue to wage war with that old nature within you, and I guarantee you, you will lose that war if you do it in your own strength. You see, there has to come a point where you decide who's going to keep control in your life. Who's going to hold the reins in your life? Who's going to sit in the, in the driver's seat of your life and guide by the steering wheel? And so we need to come to a point, and by the way, testimony is plenteous are of Christians who have who have come to this point. Every believer needs to come to this point where we make that one and final decision who's going to have ultimate control of my life. And until you come to grips with that issue, folks, you will never enjoy the walk with God in the fruit of the Spirit and in the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. This is that empowering, that enabling, that, that wonderful stabilizing grace that keeps you in the time of trouble. I dare say I'm speaking to some this morning who have, uh, who have come to that point of salvation. You know your sins are forgiven. And you know a fellowship with, the, with God by His Holy Spirit. But you have never fully turned loose of the control of your life into His hands. As I have sat in and out of these sessions all week long, and as I've been in my hotel room, I've been praying a private prayer in my own spirit. Oh God, may a fresh Pentecost fall upon us this morning. May we see a moving of your spirit that will settle some of the issues and some of the confusion in people's lives. Paul, Paul wrote to the early church, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So in the message this morning, I want to deal with three questions. I want to deal with three issues. 
And I want to answer the question, what does a personal Pentecost mean to my spirit? You see, we can talk in historical terms this morning because the day of Pentecost actually occurred. And some of us can testify to the fact that we have had a personal Pentecost, a moment in time when God the Holy Spirit has taken control of our lives, purging our natures of the of sinful motives and sending us forth in service to Him. But what are the results of a personal Pentecost in my life? Beyond the moment in time, when we realize that our that our motives have been purified and purged, and we have experienced this wonderful fullness of the Holy Spirit. First of all, I want you to notice that we have identity with Christ by the Spirit. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 that we have this new spirit who cries out within us, Abba, Father. I believe in, in the Old Testament scripture there is only one place where God is referred to as Father. And that's because that's because we had not the, the family of God had not been established. God was still in the process of carrying out his plan. The plan was already made. The plan was already in place. God was preparing the way to accomplish the plan. When Jesus came, as the Son of God, he taught us to pray, Our Father. That term that, 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 that establishes that we are part of God's great family. Almighty God is our Father. Jesus Christ is our elder brother. Over the last couple of years, I have found out that that, that, that family reaches literally around the world. Because you see, the Spirit of Christ dwelling within me bears witness with the Spirit of Christ dwelling within you that we are brothers and sisters in Him. And so this great family was established by Jesus. When he came and, and had his ministry here on earth and he redeemed us by his blood shed on Calvary, he established a new relationship for us. He said it's to your advantage after his resurrection. He said it's to your advantage that I go back to the Father. Because if I not, don't go back to the Father, I can't send the Spirit to you. 
But when he went back to the Father, he instructed his disciples to wait in the upper room, and they waited, and they came into one accord, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon all of them. And the witness of Scripture is that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And thus was established this great church of the living God. Now Paul writes to us, as I, as I quoted a moment ago, that God has placed within us the Spirit who cries out from within us, Abba, Father. And the, and the fact is that that word Abba is in the original is repeated. It's, it's tw actually printed there twice, written there twice, and there's a reason for it. The, you see, Abba is a term of relationship. It's a love term. It is not the same word as, as we talk about in terms of father that establishes father-son, father-daughter relationship. I don't know what it is in Mizo, but in English, it's the term Papa. It's a term of love and respect and endearment. It's that name that your children, dads, use as they come to you and they just want to sit in your lap for a while. It is a word that, uh, that my daughter would use if she were small again and uh, she would come in to uh, sit in, in her dad's lap. She would come from time to time after I would get in from a from a long day of pastoral duty. She knew just when to wait and just when to come. And just when I was settled down for the evening. She would crawl into my lap and she would snuggle up close to me. She had a way of putting her head just right under my chin. She would look into my eyes. And she would say, Daddy, I love you. And in that moment, I would move worlds if I could to supply anything that little girl wanted. And I'm here to proclaim to you this morning that in the Holy Spirit we have identity with Christ so much so that we can come up close to God the Holy, uh, God the Father and, and, and move up close to Him 
and, and know that He loves us and He cares for us and He will supply for us. Anything you need this morning. If you're living in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and living in His fullness, God has already promised to supply for you. Hallelujah. But secondly, not only do we have identity with Christ through the Holy Spirit, but by the Holy Spirit, we also have instructions in the ways of Christ. In the book of John, chapter 16, Jesus says, When the Spirit of truth is come, He will lead you into all truth. He will remind you of the things that I have taught you. Now here's where a lot of people fall short in their understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. Some people think that when the Holy Spirit comes, He glorifies Himself. But Jesus plainly taught us when He, the Holy Spirit, comes, He will glorify me, Jesus, just as I have come to glorify the Father. So everything we understand about the work of the Holy Spirit has to point back to what Jesus did and who Jesus was. Paul wrote to the Galatian church about the fruit of the Spirit. And all of those, all of those qualities, love, joy, peace, patience, uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, all of those fruit of the Spirit are characteristics of Jesus. You cannot work up agape love. You have to be given agape love by the Holy Spirit. You will not have the peace of God in your own strength. It comes by the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is developed in your life as you live life walking in the Spirit. Because the Spirit those gifts as He desires and as He sees fit. You seek the Spirit and let Him give the gifts. Paul wrote to the Colossian church, This is the mystery of life. Christ living in you, the hope of glorious things. If I were to face this life in my own strength, there is not much to build hope upon. But as I walk in the Spirit, I, can, I am continually reminded that I live a life that ends in a greater world than this one. And I have hope of greater things yet to come. That hope only comes by the Holy Spirit. Now let me let me share with you something this morning.
There are some things that happen in the church these days, and at least they happen in the States. I assume they might happen here. There are some things I believe that God will not tolerate and is not pleased with. About every church I know of has uh, somebody in that church who loves to get a hold of nice little bits of information about everybody else in the church and spread it around. And God isn't pleased with that. That's not the way Jesus would act. Occasionally somebody gets all bent out of shape, out of sorts with somebody else because they didn't agree with them on a certain issue. I'm here to tell you this morning there's room for all kinds of opinions in the church. And if you disagree with somebody and you think their opinion is ridiculous about something, you pray for them instead of talking about them and backbiting. You won't believe this, but I, I've even heard of preachers that get all kinds of problems with this that matter because somebody else's church is bigger or somebody else is seeing more people saved or somebody, some other evangelist is, is, uh, is seeing a greater move of God's spirit. The Bible teaches me that I must rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And we ought to praise God that God's we're doing a work in somebody else's vineyard. You see, you see, we are called upon to allow the Holy Spirit to put Christ-like features within us. So let me just ask you a quick question in passing. Are you more like Jesus today than you were six months ago? Are you experiencing his gentleness, his kindness, his, his uh, patience in your life? Are you living a self-controlled life? More importantly, are you living a spirit-controlled life? Paul says that the way we do this is by not letting the world squeeze us into its mold, but rather to renew our minds and thus see our lives transformed. The most, the most extravagant and the most complicated computer ever devised is right up here in the mind of man. And when you enter this life of the spirit, you need your computer reprogrammed. 
And it's through the teaching of God's word under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that God reprograms our minds. But I must hasten to the third aspect this morning that I want to deal with, and that is simply this, that by the Holy Spirit we not only have identity with Christ and instruction in the ways of Christ, we are infused with the authority of Christ. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when Jesus gave us the promise of the Spirit, He said, you will receive power. I want to use the word authority there. You will receive authority when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Because the next statement is not that you will receive power to work miracles or power to do great and mighty works, but that you will be my witnesses. Notice that he told his disciples, don't you dare go out into the world until you have been endued with this authority from the Holy Spirit. When Jesus walked here on earth and did his teachings and preachings, they said about him, no one ever spoke like this man speaks. Why was that? It was because Jesus was the first person who could ever stand on this earth and speak with the absolute authority of God the Father. Jesus was God in flesh. And he spoke with the authority of Almighty God. And Jesus is saying to the church, when I go back and I send the Holy Spirit, I'm going to give you this authority, this power to live within you. I can prove in two different instances where this is true. Do you remember when Jesus was teaching about faith? He said, if any person will have faith, just the grain of mustard seed. Did he say, you will say, God, would you please move that now? He didn't say that, did he? He said, you will say to the mountain, move, and it will move. And I would say to you, that is authority. The uh, two disciples, uh, uh, Peter and John, on their way to the temple. <laughs> And 
And uh, when they get to the gate of the temple, there's a, there's a beggar there who is crippled and has to beg for his living. And he's begging for, for a few pennies or a few, a, a, a few coins from them. And they, and they said, Peter said to him something like this, we don't have any money to give you. We don't have any coins that we can share with you right now. But what I do have, I'm going to give you. And he took him by the hand, and he raised him up and he said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk he didn't fall on his knees and start praying he spoke to the man's issue he spoke to the man's condition and he pulled him to his feet that, my brothers and sisters, is the authority of the Holy Spirit, the authority of God Almighty living in the life of the believer. I told uh, Brother Morris last night that, uh, that this sermon is, a, is really a two-hour sermon when I preach it without any interpretation. He said we might want to have tea break in the middle of the sermon. <laughs> But I really am coming to a conclusion at this point. Because you see the problem lies about 12 to 18 inches above our hearts. It happens in our mindset. You see, we look at our own experience on one hand. And then we look at the Word of God on the other. And we come to the conclusion that since my experience does not measure up to God's Word, then there must be something under there must be something wrong with my understanding of God's Word. And we do that because if there's something wrong with my what I experience, with my experience, then I have to deal with it. <laughs> I have to do something about it. I can't go on the way I am having that knowledge. And so we convince ourselves that it must be our understanding of God's Word rather than our experience and rather than trusting in the word of God when it says that every believer can live in the fullness of God's Holy Spirit we come to the conclusion it just can't be any better than what it is right now. And we rob ourselves of joy 
and peace and God's love manifested in our lives in the measure that he wants to give it. Let me quickly tell you a personal story, very personal to my life, uh, in closing. My first night in the service was Wednesday night, or, or my first morning was Wednesday morning, and I was introduced and I told you a little bit about my family and uh, my wife Sharon who passed away in January of 2003. And uh, when uh, she had uh, dealt with bone marrow cancer for eight years, when uh, she was first uh, diagnosed, we, she was experiencing some very severe pain. They ran tests and x-rays and, and uh, after that they sent us to a specialist. Realizing as a pastor, I was in and out of the hospital a lot, and I, and I uh, knew the specializations of the different doctors' names. And when they called us about the appointment, I immediately knew that they suspected cancer. None of us likes that word cancer. I don't care how close to God you are, cancer will cause you to stop in your tracks. But I remember the night before the appointment with the, with the uh, cancer specialist, Sharon and I sat down in our living room together. And we came to three conclusions. And they were these. Number one, Jesus Christ would still be Lord Cancer would never be Lord of our lives. You see, folks, you don't, you don't set your strength patterns when the attack comes. You train your spirit ahead of time for that. And many years before, we had both, we had both personally come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives and nothing else would take that place. Secondly, we came to the conclusion that he would never give us any experience that his grace would not be more than sufficient for us. You may be here this morning facing something very serious, and I want to tell you this morning, if you're a child of God and you're walking in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, I want you to know that God's grace is sufficient for you. Whatever you're facing this morning, God's grace is more than enough 
to hold you steady in the middle of it. But there's a third truth as well. And that conclusion was this. God would never ask us to go through any experience that he would not walk right alongside us all the way through that experience. I want to tell you this morning the promise of God, I will never leave you nor forsake you, is just as true today as it was the day that it was put into the Word of God. And God has promised His presence by His Holy Spirit living within us. To enable us to face anything that life or Satan or other people throw our direction. My question this morning to you is, are you living in the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Have you established the truth in your life? Have you settled the issue in your life? Who's going to have ultimate control? And you've decided it's going to be him? The Bible tells us that when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, they were all in harmony, they were all in one accord. I dare say I'm speaking to somebody that before you can experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to go make some things right with other people. Attitudes you've displayed, words that you've spoken, deeds that you've done against other folk. Those things need to be made right before you can establish fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. And there are no doubt those here this morning who knew one time that keen edge in your life that you knew the fullness of by the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I'm an evangelist. I preach and I teach for people to respond to truth. And I know it's not your practice to raise your hands, but I want you to just personally ask yourself the question, do I really want some, do I really want the Holy Spirit to fall on this place this morning? And if you could say yes to that question, I want you to stand to your feet right now.
As I pray, I want you to let God the Holy Spirit search out your own spirit. Believe me this morning, friend, no matter what it takes to get into harmony with God the Holy Spirit, it is more than worth it. Our Father God, we come to you this morning. In the name of Jesus. That name that is above every name. The name that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is indeed Lord to the glory of God the Father. The name of the one who told us you have not because you ask not. The one who told us that if you be human and evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? In this moment, Father God, we present ourselves, each one of us, we present ourselves afresh and anew at your disposal to do with and to do through whatever needs to be done. Amen. Holy Spirit of God, search our very inward being. Amen. Cleanse those things that are impure and unlike Jesus. Father, if there are attitudes that need to be purged, purge them from our lives. Give us strength to make things right. Having cleansed us of all that's impure, oh God, fill us afresh and anew by your Holy Spirit, I pray. All of this great crowd of people this morning, I pray. Lampai sua Krista, mitiangin, kandin, kandokdaye.